Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome Kate Jones onto the podcast for a conversation about retrieval practice, and in particular, retrieval practice in primary. Bit of a warning in advance, you're going to need your notebook and pen because there are plenty of notes to take down during this episode. And in the episode, I promise a super thread. I'm at MathsConf 30 this morning, but I promise that that super thread will be incoming as soon as I get the chance. So that's enough for me. Without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary education. So this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Kate Jones. It's great to have you here, Kate. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. No, I mean, the pleasure's all, all mine, and I'm sure that my listeners too. Um, now, we always begin with our guests in numbers um, to get a feel for who they are. Um, so my first question to you is, years as a teacher? I've been teaching since 2010. So that's, well, I say 12, but the last academic year, I only taught for one term because I was international in Abu Dhabi and I moved back to the UK. So I taught six years in Wales and five and a bit in Abu Dhabi. Nice. Books published? That's a good question. Seven. Um, I've written eight. That hasn't been published yet. And I've got a few more on the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's impressive. <laughs> Articles written for education publications? Yeah, I try. Uh, I was thinking about how many I've written. I'm, I think it's 13 for the TES. Uh, also written for Homework magazine and magazines in the Middle East. I don't have a number. I'm so sorry. I could probably say about five different magazines that I've written for. Yeah. No, I mean, to be honest, when I thought of that question, I thought there might not be an answer to this. There might be no way of tracking, you know, like you go back all the way to 2010, but just to sort of be <laughs> what them was. To reflect, yeah. <laughs> Most important year group? Oh, what a question. Uh, for me, as a secondary school teacher, mainly that's what I specialise in, I'd say year seven, because if we get these good study habits in place then, get, you know, in terms of behaviour as well and routines, then it makes just the rest of the school and career easier for everyone. So year seven, but I do, I do wish I was a primary school teacher full time and one day, so then I think I'll be key stage two then, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite year group? Yeah, um, I'd probably say year seven again, because I did teach internationally, I taught years five and six, and as much as I love teaching A-level and the older students and GCSE, oh, it's just something so lovely about younger students. So in terms of secondary, I'm going year seven again. Nice. I mean, quite often you'll get the most important to the youngest, favourite ones to the oldest, but you know, yeah. it's really interesting to you if you've chosen year seven. That's, that's great. And number of tweets? Yeah, I have no idea how to find this out. Um, <laughs> I tweet far too much. Um, I've just got 50,000 followers today, so that's a good number. I, that's an, I don't know how many tweets, uh, but I know how many followers, so <laughs> that's a, <laughs> but too many tweets, yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised how often that question stops people. <laughs> so, Kate, you're a Senior Associate for Teaching and Learning with Evidence-Based Education, Teacher, Ambassador for Winston's Wish, author and writer. Tell us about your journey and how you got here. Yeah, so thank you, got everything right. In terms of my current role with evidence-based education, I'm still brand new. This is my first month working with them. Um, for anyone not familiar with evidence-based education, you really should check them out and their work they've done with the model for great teaching. Um, just yesterday, they published a new evidence review about leadership, which people are praising me for. I was had nothing to do with it because I've just joined the team. Um, so that's what they do, the research and the evidence reviews, and then they share that with teachers. So it's fantastic that I can be a part of that, really focusing on the teaching and learning side of it. Um, but as, as I said, I started off as a classroom teacher. And then when I went international, I really wanted to stay in touch with what was happening in the UK. And I did, I used Twitter for that and um, other social media platforms. But then that led to me sharing, writing articles. There's a lot of us that have probably gone through that same journey. 
where we've been doing a lot inside our school and outside of our school. And then we go to conferences and then we're on Twitter and then we write an article, then we write a book. And <laughs> there's a few people who follow that, that pattern. Um, and the Winston's wish that you mentioned, yeah, that's, that's really interesting and important to me. Uh, I'm an ambassador for Winston's wish. It's a charity. And the charity is all about supporting young children who grieve. And this is so important because if you think about the schools that we work with, we'll uh, always work with children. There'll be someone in our class who've experienced grief. Um, that could be a parent, a sibling, a grandparent. And we're not, we're, we're not adequately trained on that. We don't know what to say and what to do. Um, but the reason that I wanted to become a Winston's Wish ambassador is because um, somebody I loved died when I was in school and I had counselling with Winston's Wish and it, that's what it was funded. I didn't have to pay for anything and it just helped me massively at a really important time in my life. Um, and then I've also experienced it as a teacher that colleagues have been bereaved or I've experienced loss and children I've worked with and it's just something that we don't talk about enough but every teacher in their career will meet or work with somebody who is experiencing grief. And uh, sometimes when a teacher doesn't say anything because they don't know what to say, that could be upsetting for a child if they think the teacher hasn't acknowledged it. So that's very different in terms of all the teaching and learning stuff, but very important. And, and I love writing as well. I love writing, whether it's an article, whether it's a book, um, it's something that, I didn't surprise, I surprised myself really. <laughs> um, I've just, with retrieval practice, I wrote, I intended to write one book and then more research was published and people asked more questions and then it became a second and a third. And then obviously the work with primary schools that I've been doing, I just thought this, this is different in primary school and I've been able to spend six months, the last six months, just in primaries, visiting schools, watching lessons, um, and that's it really yeah so very, that's it as if it, that's <laughs> love it I, I appreciate I'm very busy um, but it's, it's, I'm really enjoying myself at the moment that's amazing I mean it must take some work ethic to, to sort of dedicate your time because I know that it certainly isn't writing a book's not the easiest thing in the world but uh, yeah, yeah it's so. tough. and when I said um, was just talking about the job with evidence-based education I think my job was announced in March, but I was very adamant it would start September because as I said, I'm a teacher. I need to, I need my summer holidays. <laughs> don't, don't make me work in, in August. That doesn't feel right. <laughs> so yeah, I do try and have the balance as well. Yeah, eek out those last six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, am I right in thinking that there's a link to Winston's Wish on your Twitter handle? So anyone who's interested in that sort of service and that, and that um, charity would be yeah. Yeah. there. I tweet about it on the Winston's Wish website. There's free online courses for teachers to complete um, uh, in terms of how to support a colleague or a child. Um, if you were to have a, a parent or a child, or if you're head of year or have a pastoral role, I don't quite know where to direct somebody grieving, then just direct them to Winston's Wish and they can sort of take it from there. So um, yeah, they're doing really, really great things. And it's there for, for people to use and take advantage of, but not a lot of people know about it. So yeah, do check out my, on my Twitter um, and their website. It's fantastic. Now, the focus of this episode is going to be retrieval practice. You know, so I thought, who better to ask than Kate Jones? Um, I think it makes sense just in case there's someone who's, you know, very new to the profession listening and they're not really sure what this is. What do we mean by retrieval practice? And I think it's great you've asked this because there is the curse of knowledge where we assume that others have this knowledge that, that we do. And I keep coming across that recently. People saying, you must know about this. You must know about that. I say, nope, I don't know. So retrieval practice. Uh, retrieval practice is something that probably teachers are doing in the classroom if they haven't heard that term. Retrieval practice is the act of recalling information from long-term memory. So it's information that has to be encoded, so transferred to long-term memory before it can be retrieved. And every time that information is recalled, so if a student is completed a quiz, they're answering a question, that the act of retrieval changes that memory, that information. 
to make it more recallable in the future. So Robert Bjork, who I'll probably quote loads, because I always do, could we say Bjork bingo, how many times I'm mentioning it, keep an eye out. Um, Robert Bjork describes retrieval practice as using your memory changes your memory. And I've just added to that saying, every time we use our memory, we improve our memory. So this is absolutely essential for all teachers around the world, regardless of subject, regardless of key stage, everyone needs to know what retrieval practice is and they need to be doing that regularly in their classroom. The cursor knowledge is prevalent, you know, but I always try to imagine what it's like to be someone who's not engaged because otherwise, yeah, you can assume so, so much and and then almost be the worse off for it. You know, I think you've given a really clear description of retrieval practice and I love the, the idea that your, your memory is improving itself as you're as you're going along. Yeah, absolutely. And it was important to say there has to be a long-term memory to, to retrieve it because I've seen some schools approach, uh, like approach retrieval with real enthusiasm, but they've rushed the encoding stage and they perhaps haven't spent as much time consolidating and checking for understanding because they spent so much time in the lesson doing retrieval and then next I'm trying to do retrieval and it, it is difficult to get right. It sounds easy and it is easy in one way to apply ask questions pull information along to memory but there is a lot more nuance to it than initially seems it's very easy for secondary to lead the conversation and so yeah. for for yourself you know visiting schools and thinking about well, what does this look like in a different context i think is really really important um, and so i think that almost frames my next question because you know, I'm really interested what can teachers do you know say when they're designing tasks to build retrieval opportunities into their their lessons yeah um, and as you said but the secondary perspective totally agree that even I started looking at retrieval practice from a GCSE and A level perspective and really focusing on it for exam classes and even my books earlier books reflect that because I'm writing about revision but there is research out there about retrieval with younger students and we'll be using retrieval but we're doing it differently and I don't know if primary school teachers do feel frustration but if they do I understand because I've seen some things going around saying every teacher must do this every teacher must do that and that's absolutely some of it is not applicable for primary someone tweeted that retrieval practice must always be written and I was furious because what about early years <laughs> and things like that or, or just all the other benefits of modern languages, um, oracy. There's so many things, and that links into your question about what can teachers do. Um, teachers can build it in a way. I think we need to think about the variety with retrieval practice. So I visit lots of schools that are doing great things, and then every now and again I visit a school who say, yep, yeah, we're fine with retrieval. We do five multiple choice questions at the start of every lesson. But what else are you doing? because multiple choice has its limitations. So in terms of what can a school do, basically these are the, the different types of retrieval practice. Multiple choice is obviously the easiest type because it involves recognition, selecting the answer that's already there in front of them. But it's a great starting point. It's great for younger students and classes, great for older students. Everyone will get that initial, initial taste of success and boost of confidence and motivation. But then we've got to increase the challenge, perhaps remove the prompts, they become short answer questions, cued recall where there's a prompt, a hint, and then free recall where, where there's no support. And that's really challenging. So teachers need to sort of start to think about how can we embed retrieval practice into our daily routine, but also ensure that we have variety. So lots of schools, especially in maths in primary, use one of my grids that has a question from last lesson, last week, last term, last year. Now you could actually have different types of questions within that one grid. So you could have um, a, a multiple choice question in, in one section. You could have draw, draw shape, or draw something in another. You could have a free recall. You, know, so you could have a cued recall. So there's, even within that, the idea of that grid is that spaced retrieval practice because and I created that because I was very guilty of just asking about last lesson so especially when you're doing your daily maths 
that's fantastic. Um, for your other subjects um, where you don't see the classes as much, you have to sort of think carefully about it, about because this is a question I get asked a lot is how long should I wait from encoding and teaching something to asking the questions? And I'll never be able to give a concrete example because there's so many variables. It, it depends on the content. Um, also, how, how well you've covered that content, if it links to something before. But there's also these factors that are totally out of sight, a teacher's control, like the timetable. You know, I had two year nine classes, one that I would see Monday and Friday, and the other one that I would see Monday, Tuesday. So that massively had an impact on the spacing between the lessons. But as long as we start to build it in and build it in regularly and go beyond the last lesson, then that's a, a really good starting point. And look what's already out there because there's loads of great retrieval tasks that, that teachers are sharing. And um, the problem is sometimes they're not always great and there's not always quality assurance. Um, but Carousel Learn, um, that was created by Adam Boxer, the questions on there are quality assured. So he has retrieval practice questions for primary and secondary that have, uh, have been quality assured and they're designed and created by teachers. Um, so that's something else I'd recommend for teachers to check out. Yeah, I know a few teachers who have signed up to that already um, and they were saying good things about it. Um, you know, and it's obviously still very early days, but it's exciting stuff. Oh, really exciting. Loads of great features. And I'm not paid by Adam Boxer to promote it, you know, or anything like that. I just genuinely have, you know, I've been to these webinars and they give you inductions and there's just so many fantastic features. Whether you've got technology or not, you can use them in the classroom with mini whiteboards. So you can use it for homework as well. So there's loads and loads of great potential uh, for Carousel Learn to be used at different points in the learning process. You're... I think it was the second book, Purple Cover. Yep, that's really, it. Go by the colours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really helped me um, because we had established retrieval practice in maths because obviously my background is primary maths and I, my project was focused on proving sort of practice in maths. But I was asked, well, how would we transfer this across into things like history and science? And I think it must be pretty much the whole of the second half of the book is loads of examples of ways you could use it so there's like templates like you say you've, you've got a grid for you know the sort of the optimum spacing but you also have like you said those different types of retrieval and i, I we find those really useful because you know you, you, i could very easily say well let's just replicate what we do in maths but actually that might not fit yeah and i really and um, that's really really important you said that because um i went to a school and i had a brilliant day i had a meeting with all of the different departments, half an hour meetings, and the school was so enthusiastic and the SLT were great and they were rolling out retrieval practice. But what they'd said was every class, every subject had to do retrieval practice at the start of a lesson as a do now. And the food nutrition department was saying what a nightmare that is. When they've got a practical lesson, they're limited in time in terms of how long they can bake and, and cook something. And then they had to do this starter. When I said, well, surely you would just start your practical and when the food's cooking, do the retrieval. I said, well, yeah. But, and then when I mentioned that back to SLT and also the same with PE, PE was saying, well, we need to do this physical warm up. We're outside. The time they got for changing as well takes time out of our lesson time. And I said, well, actually, you know, you can get out there, you could do your warm up, you could be doing verbal retrieval practice. So there's all these different ways that retrieval practice can work. And it's a difficult one because it, it's, I'm going to say this as a contradiction, but hopefully I'll explain myself. It absolutely will need to be different in some subjects, but we can't say it should look different in all subjects because all subjects can be doing multiple choice, verbal retrieval, cued recall and free recall. So it is about sharing these ideas and these strategies and then applying them to, to how often you see the class or the, the type of lesson that it is. But there's a place for it. And then that's, that's what causes a little bit of a resentment towards retrieval practice is when it's not quite working for teachers because it's being shoehorned in a way that, that doesn't fit. So it is about finding a way where it does fit and it does work 
And that's why the reflection with retrieval is absolutely key. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'll ever understand why we as a profession want to insist that things happen in a certain way, because if you, you go to research ed, I mean, even speaking to people on the podcast, you know, talking about, you know, this is what we think should happen. This is how we might want to behave because there's enough evidence pointing in this direction. But when as soon as, soon as you put limits on or like restrictions on anything, I think, you know, that's almost a red flag. You think, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe they'll stop a second. Well, the other thing is about saying, oh, well, we'll do it for five to eight minutes. And I, I think that's come from Mosenshine's principles of instruction, the daily review. Mosenshine's work is brilliant. But I think, wait a minute, this is one of the most effective teaching and learning strategies. And you're going to cap it to five minutes. Why, why on earth would we do that? And I haven't encountered, and I have asked people, but I haven't encountered research that says retrieval practice is best at this point in a lesson or this point it i do think it's a great way to start a lesson because it's a good routine and it can flow into building in with what's coming next but it might just not be practical they might need to just come in finish something off or they might actually have a summative assessment where it wouldn't make sense to do a retrieval task and there's just all these sorts of different factors um that come into it so i, I had a slide in one of my presentations that had the nike tick just do it. And that's what I was saying. Don't stress about, you know, timing yourself at 10 minutes at the start or whatever. Maybe you do it in the middle as a transition into the next task, you know, or maybe you do retrieval practice at the end with not questions based on that lesson, but further back. So the, the key point is to be using retrieval practice. Um, and there has to be that it's difficult because you want the consistency across the school, because I know what it's like as a teacher to be using retrieval practice, to be reading books, and there's only a handful of us doing that. <laughs> um, and it's not part of the culture, and that's very frustrating. It's much easier and better when everyone across the school is singing from the same retrieval practice hymn sheet. But then you've got to have that element of flexibility with it as well. So it does, it's not just retrieval practice, this happens with a lot of things we've seen in education, as you've said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm totally with you. I think, I mean, it's been a long time since I read it, but there was a learning scientist summary of retrieval practice on the front of the charter college page i think it was where the, the, the college was sort of first coming about um, and they said it doesn't it's it doesn't matter when it happens it's the act of retrieving that's important so like you exactly what you're saying just 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 try, get the kids to try and retrieve the stuff that they've encoded into their hopefully long-term memory that's, that's that's the main thing isn't it well that's exactly it that you're doing retrieval practice and that's great and, and as i said i've seen it i observed a colleague of mine uh, who used a retrieval as a transition. She was asking some questions because the questions were linked to, to the new content and linking the old. And it was, it was, it was perfect in that, in that setting. You know, and I never say, well, actually you should have used it at the start because that teacher knew better because it was her class and the way she did it, it just was, it was seamless. And it, and it really made sense was it, it is becoming a risk of being a bolt on. And then we've got this thing, like you said, about primary as well. It's totally different in terms of the curriculum in primary to secondary. So to say start every lesson, well, oh, I've got, I do art once a week or something like that. How long should I dedicate to retrieval? And then I do maths every day. So it is, it's apples and oranges, isn't it? I mean, it's funny you mentioned curriculum. Does retrieval practice have a role to play in our curriculum design? Yes, so we've been talking about knowledge-rich curriculum for years, but we need to also talk about evidence-informed curriculum design because there's one thing as all being aware of cognitive science and, and doing certain activities, but actually we can design our curriculum in a way to, to really enhance and get the most out of retrieval practice. Um, I came up with a, a five-step plan, which I'll talk about now if you don't mind. Um, and this is because I was at a turning point where I'd been using retrieval practice for quite a few years as tasks in a lesson. So every lesson had some type of retrieval. And then I started thinking about, well, maybe I should use this type of retrieval at this point in the curriculum. Or maybe I should use something a bit different here. Um, so basically, I'll go through this five-step plan. And the first point for any school leader, teacher, regardless of subject, but is to know what is it in terms of the curriculum that students must know and be able to do. 
because the core content, the absolute essentials should be at the heart of the retrieval tasks and the quizzes. And that sounds like a really obvious statement, but when I look back at my old quizzes, there were filler questions, there were funny questions, there were some interesting ones, but actually really have got to hone in. Um, and there is something, I won't talk about it a lot, it's called retrieval induced forgetting. And again, this is based on the work of Robert Bjork. And this is something that I initially read and had to email him and said, I'm stuck, <laughs> can you help me? And he was like, oh, don't worry, Kate. You know, he basically, you know, a dummy's guide to, to retrieval and juice forgetting. Um, but, but he was just saying um, that if, if you want your students to remember it, hone in on it. And actually, if we focus on or ask a question, uh, and the example I give is that where all this came about, I was designing a multiple choice quiz. I had 16 questions, wanted to round it up to 20. So I started writing this question. What was the name of the historian in the video clip we watched? Now, I stop myself, they don't need to know that. But if I put that in my quiz, my students could understandably think, I got to know his name. I've got to know the name of Dan Snow. And Miss might ask me that again. And they don't. So they could learn the name of Dan Snow at the expense of something else that they do really need to know. And also, we're up against it in terms of time. So why am I wasting time in a lesson asking non-essential questions. There are loads of things that we tell students that are just interesting, they're contextual, they help with understanding, but they don't necessarily need to be retrieved. So that's it, the starting point. And also across a department, um, what, and this is why I came up with the curriculum plan because there was, there was five teachers in the department that I was leading and we were sort of doing our own thing. We were all teaching the same topic but we were using different quizzes. And what that meant is that there were different levels of knowledge and this class would know something in a bit more detail than this class. And they should actually all have the same core knowledge and core content. And once you've got the content ready, then you've got to have a range of low effort, high impact strategies and tasks. Low effort is for the teacher, because if we're going to use retrieval practice every single day, it has to be workload friendly and sustainable, not hours of planning, not hours of marking. Dylan Williams says the best person to mark a test is the person who's just taken the test. Um, so we've got all of these sort of our folder, our toolkit of retrieval tasks that we can dip into. So once we've done that, then we need to think, OK, I'm going to plan it into the curriculum. Now, this is where it gets tough when you teach GCSE and A-level and you don't have any flexibility. You've really just got to teach to the specification. So when you're introducing more retrieval, you think, oh, I've still got to teach all this amount of content. So then what you might do is teach your lesson a bit differently. You might do a bit more in terms of the homework, better use, be a bit more efficient, or perhaps even lower down in the school or in primary uh, and key stage three, you might think, well, I'm not going to be, we're not going to be able to teach this much content. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll do this topic and we'll do it really well, and we'll do it thoroughly, but we might not get to this. And it's those difficult, you know, uh, Lake Sharma writes about this, stick or twist, what should you do, keep or change, uh, and so on. So we have to build it into our curriculum and plan it, but then also be prepared to be responsive, because that's what retrieval practice does. It throws things our way. It shows us what students can recall, what, what they've easily understood and can remember, and where the gaps are in their knowledge. And sometimes these gaps in knowledge, we might not have prepared for that because you think, oh, I taught this last year and everyone seemed to grasp it, but they don't this year. So then we've got to be responsive to that. Something else, and this was a, an article that I co-authored with Robert Bjork and Dylan William, and we published it last August, ahead of September, saying don't do retrieval practice when you go back in September. <laughs> I never thought, what? They've changed their tune. But what we were trying to say is, there's been, as always, a six week break and a, the summer holidays and a dip, because I think we can assume students haven't been studying every single day in the holidays. Um, and also there'd been the COVID pandemic and online learning. But what that means is after a break is that their retrieval strength will be low. So if we quiz children on, so let's just say I've got year 11 and I say first lesson back in September, I'm going to quiz you on what you did in year 10. Here we go. And then the students are struggling. 
to recall. They don't do that well. It knocks their confidence and their morale. The teacher thinks, oh, I've got to teach that all over again. It's really frustrating. So what we said is if there's been a gap in learning, um, then do a review of a refresher. So instead of me saying, I'm going to quiz you, I'll say, right, okay, I'm going to show you this little video clip to give you a reminder of the content that we did in year 10. But then next week, I'll quiz you on it. And this could be in September. It could be in January, whenever there's been a break. Not even when there's been a holiday. It could be the fact that there's just content that hasn't been taught or discussed for a very long time. So if you're teaching plants in year six, instead of going, right, I'm going to quiz you, what can you recall from year four? Well, <laughs> that's a long time ago. It doesn't, re retrieval strength, sorry, I've used the curse of knowledge again. Retrieval strength, for anyone who doesn't know, retrieval strength refers to how accessible um, information is. So if you can recall something quickly and easily and confidently and correctly, retrieval strength is high. If a student can't answer a question, they can't remember, or it's just really slow and difficult, Instead of assuming that they forgot and that they never understood it in the first place, let's assume that it's there in their long-term memory, but their retrieval strength is low. And that's not a problem because there is a way to boost retrieval strength, and that's by doing retrieval practice. Or the refresher and the review will boost it because they'll be exposed to that material. It'll be a reminder. It's all coming back to them. So then when they are quizzed on it, then hopefully they'll be more successful. So it's about looking at your academic calendar and then also looking at the bigger picture in terms of a whole primary curriculum, in terms of a two year course or key stage three, because that grid I mentioned that has last lesson, last week, last term, last year, the last year box, well, the way I designed it, shouldn't be something that students haven't seen for a year. It's what was taught a year ago, but they'll probably have been quizzed on it between in, in that year between now and then because if it's something that they haven't even mentioned in a year retrieval strength will be low so it's about knowing when to do retrieval and when not to in terms of the curriculum um, and then the final part of my five-step plan is reflection is that come back whether it's reflecting on your own in a department a colleague of mine said Kate retrieval practice is hijacking my lessons I'm spending way too long I thought, well, we're not going to scrap it, but we can do it differently. Perhaps you do more multiple choice questions because you can get through more of them. Perhaps we could find a way about the feedback, but we'll still do retrieval or just reflect, <laughs> reflect on what is really working and what perhaps isn't working. So embedding it across the curriculum, it's like learning. It happens over time. I mean, that, that's massive. Um, and I think lots of primary schools at the moment are really considering what their curricula look like and obviously there's renewed emphasis on the the quality of the foundation subjects that perhaps wasn't there in you know the, the early thousands in the in the schools you visit did you notice that they were like you said you said do a bit less but do it really really well was, was that the general sort of mood you know let's make sure we've got space for retrieval but we might not necessarily have as much content as we used to have yeah, and that sort of was inevitable in a way because they were doing this retrieval that they they may have been doing before but not as thought about it as much or um, it was just very, very sort of quickly and as now it's something that they were focusing on. But it's taking time and it does require time because if you do retrieval practice and you skip the feedback and reflection, again, you're not getting all the benefits. So there's, there isn't more time in a school day so actually something's got to take a hit and that's a really difficult conversation. Um, but then it forces schools to really look at their own curriculum and try and put these arguments forward. Well, we've got to teach this. And sometimes you'll know in maths, there's obviously there's things you have absolutely got to do. But there, if there's areas of flexibility, then you think, okay, we'll have to do that. Uh, and something else I would say, I know that I'm sure your listeners are outside of England and this is not just about Ofsted pleasing, but it's great that Ofsted mentioned retrieval practice, about know more, remember more. It's in their 2019 guidance report. Um, but I've had conversations with teachers where an Ofsted inspector has asked a question to a student and the student hasn't been able to answer it. 
And it's because that was not taught. And the teacher said, actually, here's our knowledge organizer and our scheme of work. If you ask a question based on this, they should be able to answer it. You know, they can't go rogue <laughs> just because, you know, my, like, like me, I'm a history teacher. Let's say I all of a sudden we come after an inspector and they say, oh, we've been doing the Tudors. I say, oh, what year did Henry VIII die? Oh, I don't know. You know, but they say, well, no, we haven't been focusing on the key dates. We've been focusing on this. But if, if the school is very confident in, in their curriculum and the core content, then you know, the officer don't design the curriculum. So officer's questions to children, to staff about curriculum have to be shaped by the school's curriculum as well. Um, and I have been chatting to a few people who work for Ofsted and saying to them, you've got to know about retrieval strength. You cannot walk up in a year five class and ask them something that they did in year three without looking at the curriculum. Because then you're assuming that they forgot it and that perhaps it wasn't well encoded. But it could just be because of the demands of the curriculum, they haven't revisited that. So the retrieval of strength is low. You know, and I encourage teachers to say that to, to, to any, well, not just officer, but anyone. It could be a parent as well. Say, well, they can't remember something that you did last year. And, and sometimes we get, we get blamed when students can't remember things. Maybe we didn't teach it well enough. And actually, let's always go back to that assumption. It's there that the retrieval strength is low. Yeah, I mean, we over the last couple of years in the podcast, we've been collecting a list of things in maths that we would be more flexible with. You know, yeah. things we wouldn't bother <laughs> including. Um, but if someone's interested to learn about retrieval strength, is the best paper to go to the one that discusses the new theory of disuse? Yeah, so that, that's it. And I'll, I'll basically, I'll tell you briefly where that this whole thing comes from. At the start of the 20th century, the leading professor in human memory and psychology, Edward Thorndike, he published a paper, the, the Law of Disuse, this original theory of disuse, which said, if something's transferred to your long-term memory, but you don't use it, you lose it forever. And that sounds like common sense and logical, and it was believed and agreed for decades, until in 1922, 19, sorry, 1992, decades later, in 1992, uh, professors Robert Elizabeth Bjork challenged this. That's why it's called the new theory of disuse, because they were building on the work of Thorndike. He said, no, actually, what we have found in our research is there's two measures of memory, storage strength and retrieval strength. Storage strength refers to how well entrenched information is in your memory. So how much detail think information there will be will depend on how well it was encoded and so on. Now, storage strength doesn't decline. The only way that storage strength can decline is with physical and very extreme damage to the brain, or if we're looking at somebody with a, an illness that has memory loss. So actually, we can safely say in our classroom, we're not dealing with that. So the storage strength remains, that so you can add to it, you can add more content detail, but it's the retrieval strength that's the big one. It can and does fluctuate, and it's absolutely massive. So. Um, if you do want to look at the research, this paper is available for free um, on the Forgetting Lab um, website. That's what it's called, UCLA Forgetting Lab. Um, and also, I can send this link to you. The Learning Scientists, uh, learningscientists.org, have written a blog. And one of the students who wrote that blog, she, she worked, um, Professor Robert Bjork was her professor. And it's a really good explanation. Uh, of that so this is the new theory of disuse which is so so important and I've just been emailing him today I'm going to California I'm going to the forgetting lab at UCLA so that's very exciting <laughs> oh that's that's awesome <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah I mean that, that's that's amazing that's up there with Einstein and because he's completely changed how we yeah well they're sorry not he they have completely changed how we understand our brains to work and our memories to work and that is like changing our understanding of how the universe works isn't it and it's still it's still not that well known and basically they're, they're so kind when I reach out to them and ask for help because I'm not an academic in the field of cognitive psychology I'm a classroom teacher and I wasn't the intended audience and Robert Bjork you know he knows that he wasn't writing for teachers they've also done a TED talk uh, they've done a TED talk on desirable difficulties um, which is really accessible 
And I think that's going to be like my mission now in life is to spread their work that they've done and, and that they've published and try, other people are doing this as well, try and make it really accessible because the implications to, they, they wrote about the distinction between learning versus performance. So when we're checking for understanding in a lesson, that is the performance. But really, if we're looking at learning, like Kirshner, Sweller, Clark said, learning is changing long-term memory, then we've got to revisit it later. So that has huge implications on learning intentions and lesson objectives, because you, you can't find that out within that lesson. If they've truly been learned, you have to revisit it. It has huge implications for any classroom observation. If you're looking at learning, if you were in an observation, you wanted to focus on a child or behavior, okay, that is different. But if you're looking at learning, you've got to come back later or you need to ask them something about what they've done previously. So there's, there's absolutely loads of things. Um, and I did write an article on the TES called Meet the Bjorks. <laughs> and it's about the new theory of disuse, desirable difficulties. Uh, I've just tried to explain it as clearly as possible. And they did check it for accuracy and help me out with that. So yeah, it's mind blowing really, the work they've done, really helpful. Nice. I mean, I think I'll try and thread as much as possible underneath the, the tweet that sort of releases this episode. Yeah. Um, all the stuff we're talking about because there's, there's so much isn't there I mean you almost mentioned this earlier on like knowledge organizers in my experience are really really difficult to do what's their relationship with retrieval practice and how can we get the most from them oh, I'm, I'm fascinated by knowledge organizers and I wrote a whole chapter in retrieval primary because when we look at the origins Joe Kirby and he created them and they were very much an exam resource and Joe Kirby you know, he's brilliant. And the way he set it out was at Michaela, we give it out at the start of a topic. This has a core content. If it's on here, you need to know it. So that will form the basis of the retrieval tasks. So I'm going to design my quiz, looking at the knowledge organizers. There's also something called the encoding specificity principle, which says if we use the same cues in the encoding stage as the retrieval stage, students are more likely to be successful. So for example of that is if I've got a knowledge organizer and it has a piece of information, um, an image at the side of it because we're dual coding or something like that, not just sticking on icons. Um, but then what we could do is ask a question and have that image as a prompt because that was used in the encoding stage. Now that was at GCSE. When we go down to primary school, knowledge organizers have got to be very different. And I actually don't agree, this is my opinion, with giving students that knowledge organiser at the beginning. And especially don't let them take it home. Because what will happen is, if you say, here's, here's a whole topic on, on, on one, one piece of paper, some might not look at it, <laughs> you know, that's what it is, and some will go away and try and learn that and memorise it without the guidance of their teacher. Or the parents might ask them questions. And the student says, well, we haven't done that yet. Um, and I included an example in my book of a key stage one teacher who told me they'd created a knowledge organiser, that Vincent van Gogh. Now, they're studying Vincent van Gogh in art, but the knowledge organiser was very much about his life, when he was born, his brother Theo, and so on. This knowledge organiser was handed out, and the student came back regurgitating all the facts, and the teacher said, can you remember what any of his paintings look like and what colours he used? No, but I know he had the, you know, I know this, I know he lived here, there. So actually, if we think about the put in art and what that aim was, would that knowledge organizer have been appropriate or would a, a collage have been better? And then something else I say about as well is the curiosity element, massive spoiler alert. <laughs> you know, let's just say you're studying a text. I mean, I give the, the obvious one, Romeo and Juliet, and they go, oh, the knowledge organizer says they both die at the end, you know? and Fine, okay, but what you wouldn't want to do that in primary. Uh, well, you don't really want to do that in secondary, either, <laughs> to be honest. But it just, you know, I, I, I when I teach the 1066, I don't tell my students straight away what will unfold. We we learn as we go along, and I love that enthusiasm and that engagement, and that curiosity. So there's that's one way I wouldn't in primary. I would not give it the knowledge or eyes out until it's been encoded. 
And then they can use it, take it home and the parents can quiz them and they can use it to practice and so on. But uh, we've also got to accept the content and how much we include on a primary knowledge organizer. I've seen EYFS knowledge organizers and I'm not sure what that's all about. Some people have said it's for the parents. Well, okay, that's different then, isn't it? We've got to be very clear what our purpose is. Adam Woodward, um, he's designed knowledge organizers that are, are beautiful. They are visually really impressive, but they are very clear in terms of the content. They have chunking with the vocabulary. And one of the things I see on knowledge organizers often are just the words. And I think that's not enough because what you can memorize a word. Could you, can you put it in context? Can you define it? It's so we've got to be very careful. Maths, again, is different with a knowledge organiser. I know lots of people in the maths community who, who are not quite sure about, um, and I spoke to Neil Almond about this, and I said, what do you think? And, and he, he's written a good blog about knowledge organisers in maths. But again, it's that sort of that, that nuance with it. And it, what we're going to do in primary if they've got like 12 knowledge organisers or something for all their subjects, it's, um, it's a difficult one. And there's another question, should the teacher create it or is it okay to download from Twinkle? And I don't have a yes or no answer because uh, I'm not a Twinkle snob if, if it can help with teachers' workload and they don't know how to design a knowledge organiser because they've not had any training on it. And if it's appropriate to their curriculum, that's fine. But obviously it's a good activity for the teachers to do because it does make them think hard about what is it students really need to know? This is what I've got to focus on with my teaching. And this is what I've come back with retrieval practice. Now in psychology, when you ask to recall something specific, it's called a target memory. Um, and sometimes students, when we ask them a question, they don't always <laughs> give us the answer that we want. And a great example of this, adults don't always. If I said to you, oh, um, what did you eat this evening? You could say, oh, well, you know what? I went out with my family, went to this restaurant. And you could take a while before you actually answer my question about what you ate. But what you're saying is closely linked to that answer. So the knowledge organizer is a document with all of the target memories on. And we should be explicit with students and say, you do need to know this. You will need to remember this word. I will quiz you on that. And that also helps with the low stakes nature. So I am a fan of knowledge organisers. I think they can be great. So many primary school teachers have been very honest with me and said they've been rolled out in our school, Kate. They're glued in books and we don't look at them. You know, we just we forget to look at them in a lesson. The students don't look at them. They don't take their books home or we sent it to parents. We don't know who's using it, who isn't. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to say, right, knowledge organisers, then it's got to be priority in terms of your department meeting your whole school training you know you really need to have these conversations and reflections about why are you doing this will it is it helping will it help what's working what isn't and there's some great examples out there there's also like everything some bad examples where I've seen some primary examples crammed full of text and they're just not age appropriate so, yeah, it was really interesting Re reading what's out there, looking at all the examples. Um, I think they can be done well, but there's a lot to think about. Nice. I mean, I think I think that's hands down the clearest response to that question, because, you know, I haven't asked anyone on the podcast, but I do talk to a lot of people about it because I was never able to get it right myself. But I think you've outlined some pretty clear principles, you know, for how it is possible. You know, because I've seen some for sale that are just like maths dictionaries. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's not the point, is it? You know, <laughs> you're not going to memorize a dictionary. Well, no, absolutely. And if it's a glossary, it's a glossary. You know, we don't have to call everything knowledge organizer. You know, like I said about the art example, well, they were looking, the, the scheme of work was saying about colors and textures. So actually, in that case, the collage was the alternative. And you know, the same, if you've got a list of spellings that students, or a glossary that students could go back to, for the maths, for example, let's say in the, you know, they, they have all the shapes um, or something, you know, on one page so they could look back in the maths. It doesn't make it a knowledge organiser, does it? 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> and then there's large organizers where the knowledge isn't organized well because it's just a load of text. So, uh, it's <laughs> there's a lot to unpick there. <laughs> I mean, I'm really glad, glad that you don't um, spoil the ending of 1066 because it's basically 300 years, the final season of 300 years of history, isn't it? Of dr oh, drama. <laughs> absolutely. And and you know what? My students are shocked when it, um, they say, who's going to become king? And I say, oh, I'm not telling you. And some students actually will go away and find out. Some won't because of that curiosity gap and they have it with some subjects, not others. But yeah, just imagine that going, plonk, here you go. This is... You know, this is everything that we're doing for the next year. Learn it. It doesn't work like that at all. And it shouldn't, you know. It's, it's, it is different when it's an exam to say, here's a specification. And there's different demands. But but even then, there'll be an element of the teacher. Like, I'm sure when Joe Kirby gave it out to his classes, you know, he still probably would have that in, engagement and so on. But he might not, he might say, not let's leave that. Um, or I've seen it done where parts of the knowledge organizer are revealed over time until they're left with this full document. You know, so there's sort of lots of different ways that, that we can approach this. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting you mentioned Adam as well there, because Adam's one of the case studies in your book. And mm -hmm. I really like the case studies in the primary book um, because I, I, I thought they just sort of really rounded everything off, you know, so you've almost got them, um, you know, this, this two pronged attack on the, on the reader. I don't know if attack's the right word, you know, something positive where, you know, you're, you're given a, a fully rounded picture. Oh, I am. Um, the case studies in the book are amazing. And they were so important and necessary because we've got um, Jerry Clay Academy with the early years. We've got the mass example with Shannon Neal. We've got Adam, um, all these people that I've just been following and learning from. And uh, we've got Lake Ashama with the curriculum. It's so, so good. Uh, and they really do. They just bought that book to life again we're showing this is this is what we've been doing because actually this is how it is with retrieval some schools are sort of leading the way so andrew percival uh he's on twitter he's at uh, stanley road uh, primary school in, in oldham amazing school absolutely incredible you know i do go to other schools and they're quite open to say well we're not quite there yet in our journey with retrieval i'll say well you should go visit this school or i can introduce you to somebody else um there's a case study in the book um, by Kerry Dwen, Kerry Eccles, um, and she, I'm a massive fan of hers. I think she's brilliant. And the thing that I really love about, well, I love her passion and enthusiasm, but what teachers need to be aware of is the episodic and semantic memories. So they're both long -term, types of long-term memory. Semantic refers to a memory which is very much factual-based knowledge, information, part of the knowledge-rich curriculum. And the episodic memory is something that has quite a powerful emotional connection. Now, you can have something that is both episodic and semantic. So I'm a history teacher teaching about the Holocaust. It's really difficult because it's very emotional and emotive. But there's also core knowledge and content that I've got to teach and they've got to learn. Now, I think what has happened in primary in the past and secondary, myself included, because there's a picture floating around on the internet of me dressed as Elvis, because I genuinely taught a history lesson about famous people of the 20th century, and I taught it through the style of Elvis Armin Presley. And I don't think my students remember anything about that lesson other than my outfit, which I spent like 50 quid on, <laughs> and, and, and my accent. And that was purely episodic. And it should have been, it should have been semantic as well. And that can easily happen in a primary school. So when you are I don't know, baking a cake of a Martin Bailey castle and they're having great fun, it's more episodic than semantic. But we've got to be careful that we don't go completely the other way. Everything is semantic and they don't have these lovely, happy, warm memories. And coming back to Kerry is I just think that she is a great example of a teacher who can focus on the semantic, teach content really well, use retrieval practice, but there's also this element of I want my students to remember my lessons and be happy and engaged and have happy memories from school so I, I think we've got to be careful not to swing one way or the other obviously the core business of education and in the lesson is teaching and learning and semantic but education as a whole sports days the christmas concerts all form up part of their memories so retrieval practice is essentially the focusing on the semantic 
And sometimes an episodic memory can make it more memorable. But why, when you're teaching about fractions, you know, why do you want to make that emotive? Sometimes it is what it is. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm not saying that there's no, you know, heart to maths. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But, but it's true, isn't it, with the semantics? So you can have both. It's about knowing what, what, what is the aim? What is it students need to know? Um, so, yeah, I lo love the case studies in my book. It's worth buying it just for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What do teachers need to know about the relationship between vocabulary and retrieval practice? And certainly in, in schools that I've worked in most recently, vocabulary was a big thing because obviously we had children coming in with, you know, poor access to language in, the, in their formative years, so to speak. And so it was really important that we were the place that provided them with uh, with the, the tools to engage with society, essentially. And, um, you know, so, uh, so what's the relationship? Oh, it... <sighs> When teachers say, oh, retrieval practice is not that relevant in this subject, I would say, is there subject specific vocabulary in your subject? And they say, oh, yes, well, there you go, because that's it. Retrieval practice is so, so important with vocabulary instruction. Um, and as, as you said, with children from different backgrounds and so on, I give myself often as an example that um, I came from a family where I'm the first person to go to university you know, very, very working class and, and nobody was academic and I was a black sheep. And I read and read a lot outside of school. And I was exposed to a lot of new vocabulary and it was quite frustrating reading and constantly not knowing what words mean. And even when I find out what words mean, I didn't use them because I didn't know how to pronounce all of them either. Um, so there's so many dimensions to vocabulary. There's obviously the being able to define it and understand it but something I also say so this is um Elizabeth Bjork her mentor was Arthur Melton and I write about him he wrote about the learning process which is three stages attention and encoding is the first stage then information is stored in long-term memory then it's retrieved now that's 1963 now I think well that's great, but it suggests retrieval is the final part of the learning process, and it isn't. Once you can retrieve information, how do you transfer it? How do you apply it? And vocabulary is a great example of that. So you can encode and read the word and understand it, but then obviously we need it to be in long-term memory and it'll be stored there. And in terms of retrieval, we could do retrieval with the spelling, with the meaning, but it the key, to vocabulary is once you can retrieve that is then the application of it using that terminology in the correct context or transferring it and in, into a, a different context where it's still correct and there's loads and loads of games but fun vocabulary games and this is the argument again for verbal and written and also students with send and english as an additional language what I've done before with the curse of knowledge is I've asked questions that students haven't been able to get right. And it's not that their retrieval strength was low or not that they weren't trying. It's because they couldn't access it because of the language. I asked a question, what year was conscription introduced? And when I said, oh, how come lots of people got this wrong? So what's conscription? So I explained it and I thought <laughs> that I'd done a really good job of it, but obviously, you know, I, I could have spent longer on that. And then my next quiz, the question was, which of these refers to conscription? So multiple choice quizzes are great. I've got a task called a keyword spotlight where I put a keyword, so I'd have conscription in the spotlight. And I would say, right, define it in your own words because dictionary definitions, unless it's a child-friendly dictionary, they're a nightmare. It, it's like what Paul Kirschner calls the butterfly defect, where you go on the internet to look for one thing and then you click a hyperlink and then you read something else and then that has a hyperlink and you're on your, you're on your sixth tab and you forgot what it was that you were originally looking for. The same can happen with vocabulary in a dictionary. You search up a word and then the student thinks, well, I don't know what these words mean in the definition. So I'll search them up and you just, you, you're moving so far away from that original term. So that's why teachers have got to explain, check for understanding, pronounce the word, listen to the word uh, from the children have the ch children say it to each other so at the heart of all of this there'll be lots and lots of retrieval with vocabulary and, and obviously as well when you've got wide vocabulary it's just it's really good in terms of your confidence as well 
and how you articulate both in you and often we're teaching we say well how do you know that works and that can be difficult to answer but not so much with the vocabulary because you know because you're hearing the students use this terminology you're seeing it in their written answers when you do think per share or cold calling they are using these words correctly and confidently so then we can say we do know this works that this is working and this Alex Quigley is absolutely brilliant. You have to get him on your podcast if you haven't already. He's done so much work with vocabulary. Um, I, I, in my first book, Love to Teach, I had a whole chapter on vocabulary and the same in the primary book. And it's a, a drum that I will keep banging because <laughs> it's so important. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes so much sense. And Alex's name it actually came into my mind because I remember reading something a long time ago about where it's about the number of times you're you're exposed to the word that you you know it develops how quickly you assimilate it into your own sort of um vocabulary so to speak and so yeah thinking about this context where what does it mean how can i use this that you're just providing those opportunities for that repeated exposure aren't you absolutely and just continuing that and that could be an important part of the not part of the knowledge organizer is the vocabulary with a clear relevant definition and um, these are the things. And also, I think it could be difficult for parents when students are studying a topic that the parents really uh, lack knowledge in and, um, and then oh, they don't know the terminology as well. So a knowledge organiser or a glossary can, can be really helpful in that sense. I mean, I'm 34 and I will say now, what does that word mean? <laughs> but I wouldn't have done that for years. I think it takes a, a huge amount of confidence to be able to say that. And there'll be some students who will say, what, what does that word mean? I don't know. And then there will others who will just let it go by and not ask or challenge or question. Um, so just vocabulary, really, it's, it's at the heart of literacy, isn't it? If you joined a school or were working in a school where retrieval practice was an unknown quantity, what would your plan be to make it central to how the school, its teachers and its pupils operated? Well, this happened to me. <laughs> this happened to me. <laughs> I was sixteen. Uh, yeah, I was at a school, and um, I think it's. I don't know how to phrase this. I've got to be careful. But if the school I was at before were great, and were sort of quite evidence informed and hot on things, and then I moved to this school under a bit of a false impression about where they were at, and it was quite clear when I arrived that I'd gone backwards in terms of evidence informed practices. They were grading less than observations. They were promoting learning styles. And it was really difficult. Um, and there was, I was a classroom teacher, no leadership responsibility. There was a pocket, few of us in the staff room who were, were reading books and on Twitter. It was not part of the culture. So I did, I, I tried to share things with the senior leadership team and line managers. I put myself forward for leading CPD. Um, I don't know if you know what popcorn reading is, but popcorn reading is a reading strategy where students read out loud. And then, so I'm reading passage of text and then I'll say popcorn Kieran, pass the popcorn to you and then you read out loud. And it was massive in this school I worked at. I didn't like it. And I started doing research and reading. And I thought this isn't a good strategy for, for various reasons, lots of reasons why. So then I presented um, a session to staff with the title, put the popcorn away. <laughs> so people knew what was coming. And it, you know, it shocked quite a few people. Um, and I probably wasn't always that popular at times because they're like, well, oh, the students like it and this and this. And um, I actually wrote about it in my book and my sister, my sister, my younger sister, she got diagnosed with her dyslexia at university and lower down and when she was in school, there was a specific English teacher that she used to miss his lessons, go hide in the toilets. And she's a really good student. It was bizarre why she would do this. She I, I don't like him. I don't like him. When I wrote about popcorn reading, she told me that's why she missed his lessons. She was dyslexic. She didn't know. She didn't like the pressure of reading out to the class a, a piece of text she hadn't seen before. You know, all this anxiety. Um, there's so many things about it. So it's really not easy to challenge. But if you work in an environment that are open to being reflective and learning, then I would, you know, send the blogs on, recommend a book, 
put yourself forward to share these things. Um, what happened actually is my students uh, ended up, their, their results were phenomenal. So I had two classes for two years and I just did retrieval practice. I thought, I don't really care you know, what they're doing. They'll have to just crack on. I'm not doing learning styles. Um, I'll do this in my classroom. Now, they got great results. But the sad thing about those students is that they were getting an eight, one boy who I've written about, and he, he wrote a case study in my book, Daniel. He got A star in history, full marks, didn't lose a mark on an exam paper. And then he was getting Ds in his other subjects. He thought retrieval practice was a history strategy, a Miss Jones thing. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't transferable in his mind. And it, it actually was. It's just, and also his teachers were doing things like they all finished the content really early and revised for months doing crammed revision. And even their revision was rereading, highlighting, underlining. So then when these results came out, people said, oh, Kate, what is it you're doing differently? I said, well, I know exactly what it is I'm doing differently. And people haven't been listening. <laughs> and they listen now, <laughs> won't you? <laughs> but you basically got two options when you work in a school like that, is to try and be part of a positive change, which hopefully is possible. Now, the second option is the sort of, not a good option, but sometimes the only option is to try and find a different school. And I did make some small changes in that school, but being so evidence of from reading and so on, and then working in a school that had a culture that was promoting things, like learning styles, a classic example. There was a lesson observation sheet that said that was five minutes, what you've got to do every five minutes. Now, I can't plan my lessons, by every five minutes, because I'm a responsive teacher. So if something comes up in a question and answer or in a mini whiteboard, that's a mistake or misconception, I, I'm not gonna look at my lesson plan and go, oh, I need to go on to this now. I'm going to be responsive. So I managed to make some changes. By the time I left, it was a different school, but also a job came up in a school that really was evidence informed. And I thought I'll flourish here because it was making my job as a teacher really difficult. When I'm saying one thing and my colleagues were saying another and the students have just got this conflicting advice about what to do and not really believing me that retrieval practice is effective. Um, luckily those students did, they were great, but, but it, it is tough and it's more common than people think. I get messages all the time on Twitter saying, oh, I've read this book and I've read that book, sadly, it's not the norm in my school and they don't they don't know about it yet you know outside of england like, there's no documentation from the welsh government that mentions retrieval practice they just say teach how you you know how you think is best and there's a lot of good things in the curriculum for wales but there's a lot of omissions as well so wales is an example where you could easily be working in a school that that doesn't reference these approaches so again, you've got you've got those two options. Try <laughs> with others. Try and find others in your staff community. Um, try and share and inform. Or, or if if it's really bad, <laughs> you have to move on because it's. I know I know how frustrating it can be. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with. You. I think that's a solid answer. I think it makes the visit to a school before interview really really important. You know, I always, I always, people always told me when I first started teaching, you know, it's really important you get a sense of the school and, you know, it has to be somebody you want to work. But I know exactly now the kinds of questions I'd be asking. And it, it would be around um, evidence of form practice. Workload during COVID, I think, is a really good marker of how a school is run, you know, because, you know, there was uh, there were varying degrees to which teachers were expected to do things during the, the pandemic. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, I would use that time walking around the school to talk about that. And also the questions that they ask you at interview. So Robin McPherson um, co-authored a book with me, The Teaching Life, and he, he's a head teacher. And in interview, he will ask questions. So can you tell me about the latest book you've been reading about teaching and learning? Now, for so many people, that would be an easy question. Oh, yes, I've just finished reading Daniel Willingham and it was great because of this. But you know, there could be some teachers who say, oh, I, I, I haven't read a book since my teacher training. Um, another question Robin asks is, tell me about your professional learning community. Where do you learn from other people? And again, that could be your maths community. That could be, it could be Twitter. It could be, you know, the historical association. 
But the questions he asks is because he's looking for obviously a teacher that will fit in with that culture and has shown that they are reflective and they're willing to learn. And it was really interesting because I had two interviews in the same day and I went to one in the morning, went to another in the afternoon. They asked me totally different questions. The first interview was all, all great questions, great questions that I thought were interesting and I was able to answer. And uh, I got that job, thankfully. <laughs> and it, and I, I knew that the whole interview experience as well was like, yes, they've got their priorities. They've they've got a vision. They've got the, you know, this is this is it. This is what I want. Um, and then the other interview was just was was not good. I thought I don't know why they're asking me that question. You know, I'm not. What's the, what's the point in that? I got grilled uh, in an interview because I got like straight A's at A level, but I went to university in Wales because at the time, um, as I said, first person in my family, there was grants. The government was saying, here's money if you stay in Wales. I had no money. So I stayed in, I went to Aberystwyth. And in an interview, someone spent about 10 minutes saying, why didn't you go to Oxford? I was like, I'm, I'm in my 30s now. That was a decision I made, you know, in my teens on financial reasons really and I just thought you make me feel like rubbish I don't want to work at this school so yeah the, the visiting the school talking to people who work there the in the interview day as well because it's great a school can look great on a website and um, we can all sort of be fooled into thinking that it could be something it's not and it could be even better than it looks on the website or you know whatever but there's it's important to get it right yeah. I mean, I've got a friend who was asked to grade a lesson during a leadership interview in 2022. And I thought, no, you, you didn't want that job. Um, but on the flip side, Lloyd, um, who is a regular contributor to the podcast, he asks his interviewees to bring one article that they can discuss during the interview. And it doesn't matter if he agrees with the article or not. It's the idea yeah. that someone's willing to think about their, yeah. their practice. Yeah, absolutely. All these things, are, there's a lot to, to, to look out for and think about. Yeah, and I'd be exactly the same if they said grade this lesson. Uh, I wouldn't do it because I'm so, <laughs> you know, I'm so against that for so many reasons. Uh, the school that were grading lessons, I'd already published one book and someone said, oh, well, I'm, I'm coming to observe you, but you know you've got outstanding because you've written a book. What? You know, so... <laughs> It's, okay yeah I could just chill out I can just you know it was ridiculous and I, I didn't like that myself either I, I just felt like okay you definitely made a judgment on me with, without setting foot in the classroom yet so it's just completely flawed <laughs> it really is <laughs> it's crazy. No, um, yeah but I, I like I said I think you're absolutely spot on and um, I mean it's been fascinating talking to you Kit and um, you know, I, I, I'm certainly going to go back and I'm going to make notes about the different things that maybe hadn't heard for a while or hadn't heard for, from it about at all and sort of then continue reading. And I know that people will be listening and they'll have their notepad and pen ready to go. And because, you know, it's been it's been fantastic from start to finish. So I'll, I'll just say thank you very much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. I, I've really enjoyed it. And as I said, I'll send you all the links because even if I just signpost someone to, to one thing, I think that'll be great. Yeah, we'll make a super thread. Thank you. Yeah, super thread. <laughs> <laughs>